Um, but yes, definitely say hi to the group. Hi hey everyone from DC. <laughs> Just a few notes here, everyone that's joining us. Feel free to submit your questions to our guest speakers tonight in the chat box. We'll be taking all of our questions at the end. Uh, we have two great speakers um, tonight that are going to give us so much information, but I know that you guys are gonna have great questions. We'll get to as many as possible. And uh, we'll be having a new uh, presentation each week on Tuesday night. You can join through our Zoom uh, registration, which uh, many of you have signed up for. And for those who are watching on Facebook, uh, we will stream these weekly on the Facebook platform as well. So you do have um, some options for viewing. So great to see so many of you Hog Island alumni, Hog Island instructors, and for all the new people out there, we can't wait until you come to Hog Island Audubon Camp and join our big family. Amen to that. <laughs> I think at this point, we all need a big dose of Hog Island. All right, so we're at the, the top of the hour, so I'm going to do a little introduction here, um, and then, Scott, I'll turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Eva Matthews Lark. I am the program manager of Hog Island Audubon Camp in Maine. Welcome to our Making Bird Connections lecture series, where we'll bring a bird-focused presentation to you each week on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. These presentations are free, but donations are encouraged to help fund our programs. The donation link uh, I will drop into the comment section in the chat box so that you have easy access. Also consider checking out all of our other programs at hogisland.audubon.org, such as our upcoming virtual fall migration camp for teens, which will be held over the weekends in October. This week, we are proud to have Scott Widensall as our guest speaker. Scott is the author of more than two dozen books, including his newest book, A World on the Wing, The Global Odyssey of Migratory Birds, coming out this spring. Scott directs many of our in-person week-long camps at Hog Island Audubon Camp, and he is an all-around top-notch naturalist, bird bander, bird researcher. Thank you, Scott, for joining us tonight to talk about bird migration. Thank you so much, Eva. It is a pleasure to be here. Not as much fun as it would be to be in the fish house on Hog Island with everybody in person, but we do what we can do uh, under the circumstances. And it's migration. It is the most exciting time of the year, one of the two most exciting times of the year. I'm actually coming to you from the Ipswich River Wildlife Sanctuary in Northeastern Massachusetts, which my wife manages for Massachusetts Audubon because we have really crappy internet at our home in Eastern New Hampshire. So that's why, that's why it looks like an office back here. It's not my office, it's much cleaner than my office. So what I'd like to do tonight is talk about bird migration because um, it's, it's hard to find anybody with an interest in nature who is, um, who is apathetic about migration. I mean, it's one of the great phenomenon in nature. Um, and particularly in times like this, when we're dealing with this pandemic, um, the reminder that there are older, um, 
more ancient and and more stable rhythms in the universe, I think, is uh, is, is something that gives us an awful lot of an awful lot of solace at this time. Um, I know certainly certainly the spring. I, I I never enjoyed a spring migration quite as much as I did this spring during lockdown. So um, anyway, give me just a moment here to uh, placate the presentation gods, and we will get started. I'm gonna. Share my screen and with luck, Eva, tell me, are you seeing what I, what I, I should be saying? Excellent. Good, good job. So um, let's talk about bird migration. Um, if you take nothing else away from my talk this evening, I want you to understand the ubiquity of bird migration. The fact that at every moment of every day, um, morning, midnight, regardless of the season of the year, there are somewhere in the skies of the Western Hemisphere, there are birds migrating. Now, obviously, spring and fall are the two great pivot points of the bird migration. There are, at this time of the year, there are billions with a B of migratory birds surging south across, across North America. So many birds that you, you have to be blind, deaf, and dumb not to at least notice the skeins of geese going overhead and the flocks of robins hopping around in your yard. But bird migration goes beyond these obvious watersheds. Um, in early July, when we are still digesting our 4th of July hot dogs and hamburgers, Hudsonian godwits like this one are taking off from the shores of the Beaufort Sea and heading south on their fall migration. Fall migration starts in July. In my, my native state of Pennsylvania, along the ridges of the Appalachians, in early January, you have goshawks and golden eagles and red-tailed hawks still migrating south on their fall migration. Fall migration encompasses like seven and a half months of the year. So does spring migration. There are birds going north on spring migration at the same time the first birds are heading back south, failed breeders for the most part, on their fall migration. So migration is this constantly shifting, never ending, absolutely universal process. And even in parts of the world where you wouldn't think migration is really necessary, we're finding that many species of birds are migratory. In fact, one of the real um, frontiers for migration science right now is understanding how tropical birds are moving, in some cases, across hundreds of miles of distance or thousands of feet in elevation in pursuit of seasonally abundant food. Because food, as we're going to talk about a little later, is really what drives migration. And we think of migration as this, this very linear north-south system, right? The birds are going south in the fall, they're coming back north in the spring, but the fact of the matter is they are bouncing all over the world like pinballs in a pinball machine. Um, I do I do field research in Alaska and you know, birds in Alaska are you know, going over three quarters of the earth's surface on their migrations every year. But the most amazing migrants, especially in terms of the sheer distances that they cover, are the pelagic seabirds. Birds like this great sheer water, like albatrosses and, and storm petrels and um, and even, even tiny little birds like phalaropes that cross immensities of distance the way we cross the street for groceries. I mean, you can have a place like Monterey Bay in California, where in late summer every year, you have storm petrels that were born in Antarctica and um, shearwaters that were born in Tasmania or New Zealand and albatrosses that were born in Hawaii and Japan drawn to that one patch of ocean at that one time of the year, again, by the explosion of food resources that makes it worth their while to cover tens of thousands of miles on their migration. There are so many birds migrating that even the night sky is, a, is full of migratory birds. In fact, especially the night sky. Um, tonight, right now, here in the Northeast as it's getting dark, but, but as darkness sweeps across North America tonight, there will be tens of millions of birds lifting off into the night sky, flying under the stars, heading south um, in, in tremendous numbers. If we could see them, it would be one of the great wildlife spectacles on Earth. But of course, it's masked in darkness. But if you're away from town, if you're away from road noise, if you're away from the hubbub that humanity causes, and if your ears are still sharp enough, um, and you listen to the night sky, you will hear these monosyllabic flight notes dropping down out of the night sky as thrushes and warblers and sparrows and and vireos head south um, in such numbers that they show up as great enormous di diaphanous blobs on weather radar. We have been fascinated by 
migration probably for as long as we've been human. I mean, certainly our ancestors tens of thousands of years ago, maybe hundreds of thousands of years ago in rock shelters in Africa and Europe and Asia, watch the migration of, um, of, of ducks and storks and cranes and other birds heading north, um, marking the passage of the season. But it's really only been in about the last hundred years or so that we've begun to understand the mechanics of how migration occurs and how birds are able to navigate these enormous distances, the physiological feats that they undergo. And really only in about the last 40 years or so that we've begun to understand the stresses and strains that, um, that we've been putting on the, the natural systems that support bird migration. I've been fascinated by bird migration since I was a kid. I grew up in the mountains of Pennsylvania, close to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. I got hooked on hawk watching at an early age. And um, about 20 years ago, I had an opportunity to set everything else aside for five or six years and just follow bird migration up and down the Western Hemisphere for a book that I was writing called Living on the Wind. This was the most fun I will ever have professionally in my life. It was like, it was like getting paid to eat ice cream. Um, I traveled from the tundra of Western and Northern Alaska all the way down to the Southern cone of South America. And for a bird nerd like me, um, you know, the, the draw was to follow the birds where they're, where, they're, where they're going. But one of the things that really struck me early on in that process was how much of the story about bird migration today is a story of people. Um, people from a host of different economic and, and ethnic and, and educational backgrounds, whether I was talking to Yupik Eskimo elders in Western Alaska or landowners in Argentina, campesinos in Mexico, um, Fish and Wildlife Service biologists in Washington, DC, or in this case here, um, uh, uh, a retired electrician from, from Alabama who had an eighth grade education but knew more about ruby-throated hummingbird migration than anyone else in the world because he'd been doing field research for decades. People from all these different backgrounds who recognized that a world without migratory birds would be too dull and depressing and monochromatic even to contemplate. So they're doing everything in their power to make sure that migration does not disappear because migratory birds do incredible things. Those of you who are uh, avid birders recognize that bird that's a male black pole warbler. That's, a, that's what they look like in the springtime at least when they come flooding north, um, heading back to the boreal forests of North America. Um, they breed across North America in the spruce forests from Newfoundland all the way to Alaska. And then in the fall, they reverse that migration. Now in the fall, they look a little different. That's what um, that, that drab greenish um, streaky green bird there's what the what the black pole warblers look like in the fall of course but they have this enormous range like I said they, they breed in the northern forests from from Newfoundland all the way across to Alaska and this little bird that is you know barely five inches long weighs less than half an ounce you could mail two of these things anywhere in the country for for a first class stamp don't um, please but you could um, but this little tiny bird that weighs next to nothing migrates all the way from the northern reaches of North America down deep into the rainforests of the Amazon and the Orinoco in South America. It's an extraordinary journey and it's especially, it's especially extraordinary because they don't take the most direct route. Um, I've been studying the, the migration of black pole warblers for the last five or six years in Denali National Park in, in central Alaska. And the black pole warblers that we study in Alaska, um, it's, you know, Look, if I were a little tiny bird and I had to fly to South America, there is a perfectly good land bridge down through Panama that would take me there. But that's not what they do. Instead, these birds will take off and make one or two enormous nonstop flights from west to east across all of North America in, uh, in September and early October, and then stage up along the northeastern coast of the United States, basically from about Cape May, New Jersey, up to Nova Scotia and so the southern tip of Newfoundland. Now, they've They've obviously missed that whole isthmus of Panama thing, but they could still go down the coast and follow Florida and hop across the Caribbean, and a few of them do that. But the vast majority of black pole warblers instead will wait for a night when a powerful cold front has come sweeping across northeastern North America with strong northwest winds, and they will take off out over the Western Atlantic Ocean on a journey that's gonna take them 80 or 90 hours of nonstop flight beating their wings continuously, flying thousands of feet above the ocean, flying with no food, no water, no rest, beating their wings something like 4 million times before they finally make landfall on the northeastern coast of South America, and then continue for another 2,500 miles or so deep into the interior of South America. 
This is a little bird and it makes that journey on about as much fat as I could fit on the back of my thumbnail. If birds were, if these black pole warblers were burning gasoline instead of fat, they would get 720,000 miles to the gallon. And we think we're hot stuff with our Priuses. Um, so like I said, birds do incredible things. And we keep, we keep discovering, well, every time we think we know the physiological limits, the, the physical limits of what a migratory bird can do, they blow right past them. Um, when I was working on Living on the Wind 20 years ago, um, the acknowledged champion for long distance migration was the Arctic Tern, like this one that nests out on, uh, on Eastern Egg Rock, not too far from, from Hog Island. And we know that Arctic Terns nested in the highest latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere, and they wintered in the, in the Southern Ocean around Antarctica. And just simply by drawing lines back and forth on the map, scientists were estimating that their annual migration was 22,000 to 25,000 miles a year, which is extraordinary for a bird that's about the size of a morning dove. But they were just guesses because in those days, we didn't have tracking devices that were small enough to put on a bird as small and light as an Arctic Tern. But we do now. And in fact, one of our um, instructors at Hog Island, Dr. Ian Stenhouse from the Biodiversity Research Center, was one of the first people to put light sensitive geolocators on Arctic terns nesting in Greenland and, um, and parts of the North Atlantic. And they discovered when they tracked these birds that they're not flying 25,000 miles a year, they are flying up to 51,000 miles a year. In fact, some of the Arctic terns that breed on Eastern egg rocks spend the winter in the Indian Ocean. These birds are flying extraordinary distances. And in fact, we probably don't really have a clue yet what the, what the true limits are for what these birds can do. I mentioned a minute ago that, that the birds that breed in Alaska, um, they give you a particularly vivid example of of the, the globe girdling scope of bird migration. Um, uh, there's a place called Eisenbeck National Wildlife Refuge in Southwestern Alaska at the tip of the South of the uh, Alaskan Peninsula. It's an amazing place to go birding. It's a gorgeous place. There are active volcanoes, glaciers, lots of brown bears. You gotta watch over your shoulder when you're birding at Eisenbeck. Um, but the birds that, that breed in Eisenbeck fan out literally over three quarters of the Earth's surface every year on their migration. Birds like um, American golden plovers, these gorgeous shorebirds. This is what they look like in breeding plumage when they first arrive back at Eisenbeck in, in early summer. Um, American golden plovers have a migration route that's very similar to the black pole warbler. They fly from west to east across North America. They stage up in the Canadian Maritimes in Newfoundland. Um, they build up their fat reserves feeding on berries and insects. They fly out over the Western Atlantic all the way down to South America and then continue all the way down to the Southern cone of South America and spend the winter in places like Uruguay and Chile and Argentina. But in the same area where the American golden plovers nest in Western Alaska, you also have Pacific golden plovers, which look almost identical to this. They have a little bit more white coming down the side. Uh, their, their primary projection of their wings is a little different, but they go the other way. Instead of flying east across North America, they fly west across the Bering Strait and down along the coast of Asia. And some of them actually fly directly out into the Pacific Ocean and make it all the way to Hawaii, which always seems like a pretty good deal to me. You know, you get to, you spend the summer in Alaska getting eaten by mosquitoes and worrying about getting stepped on by, by brown bears, but you get to spend the winter in Oahu. But the most amazing migrant that leaves Western Alaska every year is one that even a lot of bird watchers don't really know about it. Um, this is a bird called the bar-tailed godwit. Um, they're about the size of a pigeon. Godwits are some of the largest shorebirds. They all um, have these long kind of upturned, slightly upturned bills and very long legs. And bar-tailed godwits are found across Eurasia, but there's a population that has colonized across the Bering Sea and breeds in Western and Northern Alaska. And every year in late August and early September, all of those bar-tailed godwits gather down around the shores of um, Bristol Bay, um, you know, kind of folded in there above the Alaskan Peninsula. And they gather at the, at the mouths of great tidal rivers, like the Ikigik River there is, at the, is what that picture is. And, and these rivers, when the tide goes out, it goes out for miles. There's enormous mud flats. And these birds use these long bills to probe in the mud and feed on polycate worms and other marine invertebrates. And they undergo a, a phenomenon that's typical of migratory birds it's called hyperphagia. You have seen hyperphagia at your last family reunion when Uncle Fred went down the buffet line. It's basically, it's binge feeding. They just, they just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. And they eat so much, so rapidly, 
that in the course of about two weeks, these bar-tailed godwits more than double their weight. They are 55% fat by the time they're ready to migrate. They, they jiggle when they walk. They have a hard time getting in the air, which is a problem because these birds are not walking where they're going for the winter. So what they do after they have eaten as much as they possibly can and gained as much weight as they possibly can put on, they no longer need their digestive system, so they get rid of it. Literally, in a matter of days, their stomach, their intestines, their, to a lesser extent, their liver and their kidneys atrophy dramatically. They shrink in size. At the same time that their breast muscles, their, their pectoral muscles that power flight, increase about 50% in mass, and their heart muscle increases about 30 to 50% in mass. They, they, they are as ripped as if they have been working out for months at a, at a gym, but they do it with, without exercise. And you better believe there are human physiologists studying this, trying to figure out, you know, how can we put this in a pill for us? But what they do after they have lost their, their guts and grown their, their flight muscles in a couple of days, they take off on the longest nonstop migration of any land bird that we know of. Um, this is the Pacific Ocean. Alaska is up there at the very top. You can see the, the little chain of the, of the Hawaiian Islands in the middle of the lonely North Pacific. And they, they take off on a night when there has been a, 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 an enormous Aleutian gale that has come roaring through Western Alaska with 80 or 90 or 100 mile an hour winds. And when those winds turn out of the North, the Godwits take off into the Pacific Ocean. They blow right past Hawaii, unlike the American, the Pacific Golden Plovers. They overfly all of the islands of the South Pacific. There's virtually no records of bar-tailed godwits landing anywhere there. They fly 7,200 miles nonstop across the widest part of the Pacific Ocean all the way to New Zealand. It is an astonishing journey. And the scientists that studied bar-tailed godwits, like, uh, like Bob Gill with the U.S. Geological Service in, in Alaska, for years, the only way they could really try to figure out how long this trip took was wait for the first flocks to leave Alaska and then contact his colleagues down in, in New Zealand and say, okay, they're on their way. And then the Kiwis would be out there waiting with their spotting scopes, waiting for the first flocks to arrive. And doing this year after year and averaging the time, they figured it was taking these birds four or five days. Again, four or five days of continuous, nonstop, powered flight. These birds cannot glide. They cannot soar. They, they're, they're not waterproof. They can't rest on the, on the ocean to take a break. They must beat their wings continuously for at least five days to make this trip. But a few years ago, Bob and his colleagues were able to start putting tiny little um, satellite transmitters, actually implanting them in the, in the body cavities of bar-tailed godwits. And they were able to track these birds for the first time in real time. And it turns out it was not taking these birds four or five days to make this trip. I mean, think about the physiological damage you would do to yourself if you were running four minute miles with no rest or water or food for five days. It's impossible. In fact, it takes these birds seven to nine days of nonstop, continuous, four minute mile pace exercise. These birds are doing things that a human athlete could not possibly dream of doing. They land in New Zealand, they, they, um, they settle down, they, they regrow their guts, they spend the winter there, they feed through the, through the northern winter, the austral summer, and then in March and April, they've got to fly back north again. And so the whole thing starts again. They undergo hyperphagia, they, um, they balloon up in weight, they, their guts shrink down, but they can't go back the way they came. If they take that same route, they're going to be fighting headwinds much of the way. So they fly the other way. They fly 5,000 or 6,000 miles nonstop from New Zealand to the Yellow Sea between China and the Koreas, one of the most critical migratory stopover points for, for shorebirds on the planet. They land, undergo hyperphagia, regrow, and regrow their guts, undergo hyperphagia, balloon up in weight, shrink their guts down again, and take off on the third leg of their journey, um, another 5,000 miles or so back to Alaska. In all, these birds are in the air. Uh, well, it's a, it's a round trip of about 18,000 miles. They're in the air every year for about 22 days, and they're averaging about 820 miles um, per day when they're flying. This is a bird that can live 25 to 30 years. So by the time a bar-tailed godwit dies, it will have flown the distance from here to the moon and most of the way back again. So when I say birds do incredible things, I am not kidding. Now, most migratory birds are not migratory to the same epic extent that, that 
bar-tail godwits and and arctic terns are. Out of the roughly 850 or so species of birds that we have in North America, about 500 of them are migratory, but there's lots of different strategies that migratory birds use. Um, When most of us think of migration, I think of, uh, probably we think of species like this ruby-throated hummingbird, um, and I apologize for anybody on the West Coast. This is, I'm, a, I'm an Easterner, and so there's a, a bit of an Eastern bias in, the, in some of the species I'm talking about this evening. Um, ruby-throated hummingbirds are what ornithologists call complete migrants. That means they have a, uh, a distinct breeding range in the North, and we think of ruby-throated hummingbirds as Eastern birds, but as you see, they extend all the way up into British Columbia and Canada. But all of those, or virtually all of those ruby-throated hummingbirds leave the breeding range um, in the fall migration, They migrate south, many of them flying nonstop 600 miles across the Gulf of Mexico, a trip that'll take them about 20 or 24 hours. And they spend the winter in in Southern Mexico and Northern Central America. So a complete migrant is a species that has a distinct breeding range in the North, a distinct wintering range in the South and no overlap between the two. But there are lots of species that have a tremendous amount of overlap um, where some populations are migratory and others are not. Um, where um, northern, northern populations might, might, might migrate into the same range that non-migratory north southern populations do. Um, this is a juvenile bald eagle. And bald eagles um, have areas where they're found only in the summer. They have areas here in purple where they're found um, year round and other areas in blue um, in their range where they're found only in the winter. Um, and the term for this, and I hate this term, is partial migrant. I do not know how a bird can partially migrate, but folks, I didn't come up with the terminology. I'm just the messenger. And then you have species like great horned owls, eastern screech owls, western screech owls, um, downy woodpeckers, um, cardinals, which are non-migratory. They they move out of their parents' territory, they find a place of their own, they settle down, and they don't budge for the rest of their lives. Um, So lots of different migratory strategies. One of the migratory strategies that gets people really excited, that gets birders in particular really excited, are the so-called eruptive migrants. And these are are generally speaking northern raptors, like this northern hawk owl, and northern seed-eating finches and and other seed-eating northern birds, like purple finches, evening grosbeaks, um, red-breasted nuthatches. Um, These are birds that breed in the north. They're content to stay in the north on the breeding range, summer and winter, year after year. But every once in a while, their food supply collapses. In the case of uh, many of these raptors, it's because the um, the lemming or the vole population cycle has reached a has reached a low point in this four or five year cycle. Um, in the case of red-breasted nuthatches or purple finches, um, it, it, it's probably because there was an abundant um, conifer cone crop the previous year. They had a really terrific breeding season, and now there's no no cones, and the birds come flooding south. I saw in the chat somebody mentioned that there are um, red-breasted nut hatches as far south as Georgia. They're going to make it all the way to the Gulf this year because it's a big eruption year for red-breasted nut hatches. We had a heavy cone crop last year. They had a very big breeding season this year, and there's very few cones in many parts of, um, of eastern Canada and New England this year. So those in the east, those red-breasted nut hatches are heading south. Um, and so when these eruptive species come roaring south, um, it really sets off, uh, sets off alarm bells and uh, not alarm bells, just a, a lot of excitement among bird watchers. So why do birds migrate? Um, you know, I think that's one of the, you know, the, the two big questions about bird migration, I think, that fascinate most people. And I think if you ask the average person, they would tell you that birds migrate because they're trying to get away from the cold, right? You know, some parts of this planet get ridiculously cold in the wintertime. And if you've got wings and can get out of Dodge, why not? Um, and that's true, but not exactly. And in fact, one of the places that could really give you a visceral sense of of why birds migrate and why some don't um, is Cape Churchill up in uh, up in Manitoba on the shores of of, of, uh, of Hudson Bay. Um, Cape Churchill is a great place to go birding in the summertime. About 120 species of birds, including species like Ross's gull, that you can find almost nowhere else in in North America. But in the winter time, nature makes a serious attempt to try to kill you in in Cape Churchill. The temperature drops down to 40, 45, 50 below zero. You have dozens and dozens of polar bears roaming around. Um, the sun barely comes above the horizon. And again, if, you know, if you're a bird and you've got wings and you can get out of there, it makes an awful lot of sense. And most of those birds that breed in Cape Churchill do. 
Um, all but a handful of the birds that breed in that part of Manitoba migrate out of there for the winter. But you can learn a lot about migration by looking at the species that don't migrate. Um, and, and one of the most abundant and, uh, and easily observed up there is this one. This is a willow ptarmigan. This is what willow ptarmigan look like in the summertime, at least. They have this beautiful camouflaging mix of brown and buff. This is a, a subarctic grouse. If you, if you find this bird in, uh, in Scotland, they call it red grouse. They're found, um, they're found across the Northern Hemisphere in the, in the Arctic and subarctic range. But in the winter time, um, these willow ptarmigan molt into an almost completely white um, plumage of feathers. They grow long feathers on their feet that act like snowshoes. And um, they're so well adapted to their to this subarctic environment that they're, they actually have a, a digestive trick that's the reverse of what the godwits do. Instead of their guts getting shorter, their intestines grow by 30 to 50% because all these birds have to feed on through the subarctic winter are the buds of those dwarf willows and dwarf birches that you see in the background, which has got to be one of the world's dullest diets. And so again, if, if it were 40 below zero and I hadn't seen the sun in three months and that's what I had to eat, I would migrate. But migration is dangerous. Um, you know, you don't know what's waiting for you on the other end of that migratory route. Storms may sweep you from the sky. Predators may pick you off. You may get where you're going and discover that California is in the middle of an epic multi-year drought where there have been terrible wildfires. Um, you just don't know what you're going to find. And if you don't have to migrate, and for the most part, willow ptarmigan don't, you don't. It's not so much that it gets cold that drives migration. It's not the cold that drives a yellow-headed blackbird out of its marsh in Montana. It's the fact that it gets cold and the marsh is sealed off under ice and that seals off the insect, the aquatic insects and, and seeds and other things that that blackbird needs to survive. Migration is mostly about food. And so it's not surprising when you think about it that the group of birds that are most highly migratory tend to be the ones that depend on seasonally abundant food supplies. Um, insectivorous birds that need insects. There are insects in the forests to the north, but not enough for the billions of birds that are there in the, in the summertime. Um, seasonally abundant foods like fruit or nectar or seasonally available habitats like open water. You know, a duck is safe from predators sitting out in the middle of an open lake, but once that lake freezes, if the duck is still there, it is literally a sitting duck. So that tells you why the Blackburnian warblers that breed on Hog Island migrate every year. Um, it's an insectivorous bird, and there are just not enough insects in the forests of Maine and across the, the, the temperate zone and, and boreal and subarctic zones of North America to feed the, the hundreds of millions to billions of migratory birds that breed there in the summertime. There, there are insects there, and we have insectivorous birds that winter there, chickadees and, and kinglets and, and, uh, and creepers and such, just not enough for all of them. So that tells you why this Blackburnian warbler migrates south, but it does not tell you why it migrates all the way to the foothills of the Andes in South America. That's an insanely long, dangerous journey. And the, re and, the, and the reason why so many of our migratory birds travel such tremendous distances has puzzled people for, for generations. It puzzled um, uh, ornithologists and bird watchers. And part of the reason we found it so puzzling is that we think of these birds backwards. We think of these as Northern birds that head south on a, um, you know, basically for a winter vacation. They head south and then they come back where they belong, where they were born. They come back to their home. But the fact of the matter is these birds spend the majority of their lives in the tropics or in route to and from the tropics. And in fact, most of the, um, most of the evidence suggests that most of these birds evolved in the tropics or subtropical environments. And when you think about it, so many of these families of birds like tyrant flycatchers and warblers and hummingbirds and orioles and tanagers are predominantly tropical families. These are tropical birds and that during these relatively brief interglacial periods over the last several million years when North America does not have you know, a giant miles thick sheet of ice sitting over two thirds of it, um, you know, as the ice recedes, these birds move farther and farther and farther and farther north each year, colonizing newly exposed land and then going back where they came from, back down into the tropics and the subtropics. And in fact, we can see this happening today 
Um, even, even today, we have species of birds like pectoral sandpipers that have moved across North America, have colonized across the Bering Strait, are going farther and farther every year into Eurasia. But come winter, they're not flying south into the Philippines or Indonesia. They're coming back across Eurasia, they're back across the Bering Strait, back across North America, and down into South America, because that's where they came from. Which brings us to the next big question about migratory birds, which is how on earth do they know where they're going? And, you know, there's, everybody knows that, you know, that's, that's grandpa up there in the front of the flock, they're leading these snow geese south. And in fact, for some groups of birds like waterfowl, um, ducks and geese and, and swans, for cranes, there, there is some intergenerational learning where young birds migrate with older birds. They don't have to learn how to migrate, they're born with that instinct, but they do learn specific routes and specific stopovers um, as they're on their way. But almost every other bird comes out of the egg with a genetically coded set of instructions that tells it to fly in a certain direction at a certain time of the year for a certain length of time. They do not have to learn where to go and they don't make a conscious decision. They are just driven to do this. And the trigger for that migration is not cold, it's not heat. In fact, you know, shorebirds are migrating in July, for heaven's sakes, in August when we're marinating in our sweat. Um, it's not hunger. These birds, after all, are migrating when they're at their fattest. The trigger for migration, like most things in nature, is the photo period. The changing ratio of daylight and darkness um, and you know, internal circadian rhythms in the bird's body that triggers this compulsion that becomes an itch that becomes an overriding command to fly. And so these birds take off at night. The vast majority of our migratory birds travel at night. Certainly almost all of our songbirds travel at night. They leap up into the night sky, this, this great exhalation of birds rising into the night sky, orienting themselves, looking at the, at, the, at, the, at the stars in the night sky, not looking at the patterns. They're not going, okay, the W is Cassiopeia, so that means I make a left. They're looking actually at the apparent rotation of the stars around Polaris, and especially the part of the night sky that is not rotating. That tells them, that gives them their compass, their cardinal points, north, south, east, west. Of course, if it's cloudy, they can't see the night sky. They, can, they have a whole host of fallbacks, uh, particularly a, a magnetic sense that we're finding is actually, they're actually using quantum physics um, to, 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 to orient themselves. They're using a form of quantum physics called quantum entanglement that Einstein thought was spooky and weird and, and uncomfortable. Um, it's happening at the, at the, at the nano microscopic level within a bird's eye that's, that's allowing them to basically visualize the earth's magnetic field as they head south. Diurnal migrants like this broadwing hawk are using, um, you know, the uh, the landscape, uh, leading lines in the landscape like mountain ridges. They're using the the apparent position and movement of the sun across the night uh, across the daytime sky, um, and heading south on migrations that will take them. You know, this is a, a young broadwing hawk that's never been a quarter mile from its nest in the forests of Quebec. It's going to travel all the way to Colombia or Peru for the winter. Um, and when these birds make these migrations, they make incredible changes in habitat in a matter of days. A black-throated blue warbler leaving the, the forests of Maine, um, you know, passing down along the coast through Hog Island, is going to go from uh, a northern hardwood forest where it's going to be keeping company with moose and black bear, and within a week, it's going to be in the forests of the, of the Caribbean, on the islands of the Greater Antilles, or the, um, the, the, the rainforests along the edge of the Gulf of Honduras. Um, we used to think that these birds probably were like, you know, the new kids on their block, kind of trying to figure their way around these alien habitats. But remember, these are tropical birds, and they instantly recognize the habitat they're in, the foods they need. They recognize the alarm calls of local birds. They are tropical birds. They are birds of two worlds. But there's a conservation issue for these birds because there's a tremendous disparity between the land area in North America and the land area in Southern Mexico, Central America, and the, the islands of the Caribbean where the vast majority of our neotropical migrants, especially our songbirds, spend the winter. Black-throated blue warblers um, have a relatively restricted range compared to a lot of North American birds, but it's still, that's a big chunk of land. And yet all of those black-throated blue warblers, because they're a complete migrant, are going to spend the winter on four islands in the greater Antilles and that, uh, that rim around the, uh, the Gulf of Honduras in Central America. So the loss of um, even a couple of acres of wintering habitat in in the tropics may be the, the conservation equivalent of the loss of dozens or hundreds of acres of breeding grounds up in the north. 
And when they move, they move in such incredible numbers that we can see them on weather radar. Um, this is a, a picture of the Gulf Coast um, in the springtime. That's Galveston and Houston kind of right there in the middle. And that is not a thunderstorm. That is what several million songbirds looks like on weather radar as they're heading north um, across the Gulf of Mexico, birds that would have left um, the Yucatan Peninsula probably about 18 or 20 hours earlier, flown across the Gulf of Mexico. Um, one of the one of the extraordinary things that we have an opportunity to do right now is harness the power of big data to study bird migration. Um, you know, we have decades worth of Doppler radar images like this that actually allow us to calculate how many birds per cubic meter of airspace there is up there. And now with, with new dual, pol dual polarity Doppler radar, we can actually tell the nose from the tail on a bird and small ones versus medium sized ones versus big ones. And I know one of the things Jill's going to talk about in a few minutes is how um, scientists are harnessing big data. Um, uh, you know, audio, audio data and weather radar data and, um, and millions and millions of checklists from eBird um, to give us an unparalleled look at bird migration. When these birds come flooding north in the springtime, for, for almost 20 years, I, I spent almost every spring um, along the Gulf Coast um, at Fort Morgan in Alabama, because when these birds come north, most of the time they can make this trip 600 miles across the Gulf of Mexico um, with ease. They can do this without even breaking a sweat, but they don't have weather radar. And so periodically they'll make that trip and slam into a, a cold front as they're, as they're coming across the Gulf with headwinds and dropping temperature and, and, um, and falling barometric pressure. And instead of an easy 18 or 20 hour trip, it may take them 35, 40 hours to get across the Gulf of Mexico. And so scientists have been, um, have been studying where the birds need to need, um, the habitats that these birds need along the Gulf Coast where they can land and refuel and bulk up because they, they have a long journey ahead of them spreading out across um, most of the, the, the Eastern two thirds of North America. And so I and my colleagues and others like us um, every year will, would show up at the, the Gulf of Mexico, spread our mist nets in the woods, um, capture birds like the Swainson's warbler, um, just for a brief time, for a couple of minutes, take them out of their life, put a band on their leg, record the number, record their weight, a couple of other quick measurements, let the bird go again. And then capturing these birds again day after day, we could see how quickly they regained weight. We could see what kind of habitats were most important for them. And one of the things that we and others have found is that the habitats that are best protected along the Gulf Coast are of the least value to these migratory birds. What these birds need are dense little shrubby thickets that nobody, they're not scenic, they're not national seashores that people come from around the world to visit, but they're crucially, crucially important for these birds. Because we know these birds are in trouble. We know that the populations of many of these migratory birds have been in steep decline. And we know that in part because we've got radar data going all the way back to the 1950s that we can see that these enormous trans-gulf migrations have been, have been occurring um, less and less frequently and in less and less, and less magnitude. And so for species like, um, like wood thrushes, um, which are, have been in steep decline for a long time, it's probably a combination of a lot of problems. Um, you know, certainly um, tropical deforestation, these birds winter in, in lowland uh, uh, rainforest in Central America, that's been a big problem, but also what's been happening up here on the breeding grounds. Um, you know, at one time, most of Eastern North America and, and across the Midwest where wood thrushes nest were relatively unbroken tracks of, of large mature contiguous forest. Um, they were a mosaic of many different habitat types, um, but all within close reach of each other. Um, I grew up in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is still 70% forest, but it is not contiguous unbroken forest. It is chopped up into millions and millions of tiny little fragments. And that fragmentation has allowed edge predators like um, blue jays and crows and grackles and skunks and raccoons um, and house cats to find their way in. It's allowed edge um, specialists like brown-headed cowbirds that parasitize the nests of wood thrushes and other birds in there. We've also developed a forest that is either um, middle-aged or, or non-existent. Um, we cut down all of that old growth, incredibly complex forest in the 18th and 19th century. And what's grown back is pretty much even age forest um, and where it's not forest, it's developed or it's cropland. We don't have a lot of those other successional stages out there. And so that's made it harder and harder for these birds to get from one place to another. And when they do, when they arrive 
they don't always have the best breeding uh, breeding habitat. You know, migration is hard enough for migratory birds, you know, storms and wind and exhaustion and all the other natural dangers. But we have made it harder and harder for these birds to get from point A to point B. Um, you know, when we first, when, when people start first started thinking about conserving birds, we focused mostly on the breeding grounds. Um, that makes sense. Then we got a little bit more sophisticated through the 20th century, started setting aside areas where these birds spend the winter, especially with the National Wildlife Refuges in many of our southern states. It's really only been in the last 20 or 30 years that we've you know, kind of figured out, well, you know, in order to get from point A to point B, they, they need a lot of stopover places. When we're making a long trip on the road, you know, we need convenience stores and gas stations ourselves. And so you know, only recently have we begun to focus on the stopover sites that these birds need. And to all the natural stresses and strains that these birds are already facing, we've added speeding cars and agrochemicals and spinning wind turbines and, and cats and windows. I mean, windows kill 2 billion birds a year in North America. Cats probably kill 3 billion. Um, we've added all of these additional strains onto birds. And now it's in addition to being a harder world for migratory birds, it is becoming a hotter world for migratory birds. Climate change is the big enchilada for migratory bird conservation. It is the biggest challenge we face in preserving bird migration in the years ahead. Um, it, is, it is an extraordinarily difficult challenge, but it is one that if, if we're gonna have a prayer of saving particularly the most dramatic bird migrations, I mean, look, the ones that I were talking about tonight that make people gasp, those are the migrations that are most delicately balanced between time and distance and research and predictable weather patterns and predictable wind patterns. And those are the ones that, that climate change, I think, is going, to, is going to endanger first and foremost. But I don't want to leave you depressed as I wrap things up here, because yes, um, migratory birds are in trouble, but there is an awful lot that we can do in our, in our everyday lives to help migratory birds. I just want to leave you here with a couple of a couple of relatively simple things. You don't have to become a hermit and move to the forest and live in a bark hut and eat, and eat bark um, to save migratory birds. Um, for example, whether you have a little tiny plot of, of ground in town or you have a farm or a big, a big plot of ground out in the country, landscape with nature in mind. And what I mean is rather than going to the garden shop and buying all of those beautiful but exotic plants from around the world that have no ecological connection to the, to the part of the world where you live, use native plants. Um, these are just random pictures from our, our house in Pennsylvania where I lived for 30 years where I've been, been uh, landscaping with native plants for, for decades. You're not giving up anything in terms of beauty, um, but these plants are bulletproof. They're resistant to diseases and pests. They're pretty much drought tolerant and drought proof. And every time you plant one of these native plants, you are knitting together broken ecological connections, providing food and cover that these birds recognize, providing you know, the insects that eat these plants are food for the birds. Um, and because these, these plants are pretty well bulletproof, you don't have to do anything to them. It's, you can be a lazy gardener. Um, and because you don't have to pamper them, be organic in your garden. You don't want to create an oasis for, uh, for wild birds and then soak it with pesticides. And there's a tremendous amount of information on National Audubon's website through its Audubon at Home program that can help you be um, a, an organic native plant gardener that can turn your, your backyard into a, into a bird paradise. So be organic at your home and buy organic when you go to the store. A lot of migratory birds spend a surprising amount of their annual life cycle, either in migration or on the wintering grounds, in agricultural landscapes. So the, 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 the decisions we make as consumers on the kind of produce we buy makes for a healthier world for those birds. Here's a really simple one. If you have a cat, please keep it inside. It is impossible to overstate the toll that, that free-running cats, whether feral cats or um, or house pets that are allowed outside have on migratory birds. The Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center has calculated that house cats kill somewhere between three and four billion with a B migratory birds every year just in the United States. Um, that ought to be a relatively simple fix. Keeping a cat indoors is way better for the birds and it is way better for the cats. So if you're a cat owner and you let your cat out, please reconsider. 
Now, this is going to seem like a weirdly specific suggestion because we're all good conservationists here, um, but I want you to, to not just recycle and buy recycled products, but particularly use recycled paper because most of the recycled, or excuse me, most of the paper that we use in the United States comes out of the boreal forest of Canada, which at one and a half billion acres is the largest uncut virgin forest left on the planet. It's bigger than the Amazon, it's bigger than the Congo, and it is a bird factory of global significance. More than 220 species of migratory birds, common loons, pectoral sandpipers, savanna sparrows, bay-breasted warblers, whooping cranes, surf scoters, they all come out of the boreal forest and we are cutting it down to make toilet paper and facial tissue. And that is not the highest and best use of the world's largest remaining forest. So by buying, um, by buying recycled paper products, you save the boreal forest for the birds. Finally, I would like to encourage you um, to drink more. And I wanna be specific here that I want you to drink more coffee. Um, and this is one of those, maybe like the recycled paper where the connection to birds doesn't seem all that obvious. But if I show you these pictures, and I ask you to pick out the photos that show a crop under cultivation. Well, obviously it's that one where everybody's, everything's planted in nice neat rows, right? Except that all of these show coffee under cultivation, but the other two show the way coffee was traditionally raised in Latin America and the Caribbean in what's known as rustic um, or, um, or shade coffee plantations. Shade coffee plantations where um, a farmer goes into a biodiverse intact functioning forest plants a few widely scattered coffee shrubs where the coffee ripens slowly in the shade of the forest and develops the amazing complexities of aroma and flavor, um, and which we are knocking down in, um, in a rush to plant um, basically crap coffee. Coffee varieties that grow in full sun that produce high yields, but do so only with heavy applications of fungicide and pesticide and herbicide and fertilizer. And why this is important for birds is because hundreds of species of migratory birds in the Western hemisphere rely on, on shade coffee plantations, either um, as, their, as their, stopover, um, uh, their stopover habitat on their way south, or as their, actually their primary wintering habitat. Species like Baltimore Orioles, blue-headed vireos, Western tanagers, um, uh, chestnut-sided warblers there, broad-winged hawks, Tennessee warblers, the list goes on and on. We've lost about 40% of the shade coffee plantations in, uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean. And we're the ones here in the United States that are driving that. Americans drink a third of the world's coffee and we like cheap coffee. The thing is, there's no such thing as cheap coffee. There's inexpensive coffee, but the cheap coffee, the price is paid by the birds. Um, so the bad news is Americans drink a third of the world's coffee supply. The good news is Americans drink a third of the world's coffee supply. So if we buy the right coffee, we can make a demonstrable difference for migratory birds. So what I want you to do if you are a coffee drinker is to look for coffee with this symbol. This is the, the certification um, label for the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center's bird friendly coffee and bird friendly habitat in general program. There are a lot of certification programs out there. Some of them are um, frankly not worth the paper that they're printed on. Um, the SMBC bird friendly certification system is by far the most rigorous certification system out there. Um, it provides the highest biodiversity among all um, uh, certification programs. It's third person, a third party certification. So um, there's no, there's no, nobody's game in the system here. There's a raft of peer reviewed science to show that the, the um, coffee farms that qualify for bird friendly coffee are almost as good for birds and bees and orchids and, and other tropical species as untouched forest. It's also, it requires USDA um, organic certification. So if that's something that's important to you, you don't have to worry about it. Um, this is a photograph um, that I took in the highlands of, of Nicaragua. Everything you see in that photograph to the horizon is a certified bird friendly um, shade coffee farm. Um, it's some of the best birding I have ever had in Latin America. Some of the, the, the largest numbers of, of neotropical migrant songbirds. So when you buy Smithsonian bird friendly coffee, and you can get it from a host of different um, uh, retailers from, uh, from different roasters. You can buy it in stores, you can buy it online. Um, you, are, you are saving boots on the ground um, land for, for migratory birds. And if you're a coffee drinker, you're gonna drink coffee and you have a choice. You can either drink coffee that actively destroys bird habitat or you can drink coffee that's actually saving it. Um, and that's not too much to ask for 
migratory birds, I mean, they're already doing everything they can. Their entire genetic legacy every year, stretching back millions of generations, um, risking it on another journey south, another leap into the void, propelled south by this, this act of faith buried deep in their bones, deep in their genes. They're already doing everything they can. The rest of it is up to us. And so with that, I want to thank, um, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I really, I'm deeply grateful to Eva and everybody at National Audubon for the opportunity to kick off this, um, this program this evening. It's a real honor. And so I will be quiet now and turn things over to Joe. And I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, uh, Scott, for that talk. Uh, Scott's going to stay on and answer some of your questions that you have been submitting in the chat box in the comment section. Uh, but next, we're going to have our Bird Connection presenter, Dr. Jill Depp. Jill is the Senior Director of National Audubon Society's Migratory Bird Initiative. Thank you so much, Jill, for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. And it's great to see that there are so many people in their homes tuning in for this. So I just want to say, Scott, that was fantastic. I, I love to hear about migratory birds and I love to hear so many people getting excited about them. And, you know, I don't think after Scott's presentation, I need to do anything else to convince you how spectacular migratory birds are. And yeah, he really primed me for this conversation. And, and I swear we did not coordinate this in any way. So thanks a lot, Scott. I appreciate it. So let me introduce to you the Migratory Bird Initiative, which is a new initiative um, at the National Audubon Society. And so you know, we think about migrations and, and Scott shared with us these fantastic stories of, of godwits and black pole warblers. And when we think about just North America, and when I say North America, I'm thinking specifically US and Canada. But we all know that Mexico is part of North America, right? But if we look at the birds that regularly breed in the United States and Canada, more than 70% of those species migrate. And they spend more than half of the year on stopover in winter grounds, mostly in Latin America and the Caribbean. And so I often remind people that when we think of them as our birds, they really actually spend up to eight months out of the year far away from us. Last year, leading scientists, leading researchers told us that in less than a single lifetime, North America lost nearly 3 billion birds. Two and a half million of them were migratory. And looking into the future, Audubon scientists have predicted that 389 bird species, again, mostly migratory species, are at risk of extinction from climate change unless we take action now. So there's this real sense of urgency. In 2018, the National Audubon Society launched the Migratory Bird Initiative to halt, and even better, if we can, reverse declining population trends by using science to focus our conservation and policy efforts on the most important places that birds rely on throughout their life cycle, the breeding grounds of winter grounds and those stopover sites in between. And with that in mind, the initiative's vision is to secure the future of North American migratory birds by identifying the places that they need to thrive across America, see the entire Western hemisphere, taking actions that protect the places that matter the most, reducing threats, and also engaging people in the joy of migration. So that's a, a pretty lofty vision and to advance towards that vision, we're designing a migratory bird conservation platform, really designed to make science actionable. Using science as basis for focusing our conservation, we're motivating grassroots efforts and creating dur durable public will. Now, at the, the core of the platform rests on spatial data. And specifically, we're thinking about eBird data, tracking data, and the bird in um, banding encounter data. And nicely, Scott introduced all of those methods to you. So it was fantastic. Um, but I'm going to add in their, their eBird. And I, I suspect there are many of you on this call tonight who contribute um, your eBird records. So let me tell you now, and I'll tell you again, please keep doing that. Um, those data are vital. 
The platform relies on these spatial data, which is really a, as a foundation. And using those data, we're distilling those data to create these, you know, this energizing portal with compelling visualizations and interactive tools. Designed to connect people's love of birds and their communities to the actions they can take to protect them, no matter where they are in their migrations, um, especially those epic migrations. Um, you know, there are a lot of places we need to protect to make sure those birds thrive. So it's a big lift, but I'm confident it's one that we can work on together and solve. Now, it's not just the platform, these online opportunities to see birds, but it's also taking those scientific data, working with our partners, our science partners, to analyze those data and deliver conservation relevant information, tools that can support our conservation and policy goals. Now, of course, you know, I always have the pleasure of standing up here. Well, I'm standing in my, my office at home, but being in front of all of you to talk about migratory birds. But truly, it, this is a, a team effort, an organizational effort. Over the last two years, we've built a diverse team, a diverse, creative, talented staff um, with expertise in science and data outreach, mapping, communications. But really, truly, this is the Migratory Bird Initiative is an Audubon-wide initiative. It leverages our strengths in storytelling, conservation, policy, and not least of which is our broad network of states, chapters, and centers, and including Hog Island, right? So we have to be thinking that that is a key part, and we can't do it without places like Hog Island and all of you who come visit. Even an organization as large as Audubon cannot conserve migratory birds alone. Our success is dependent upon partnerships with conservationists, with scientists, and through the MBI, we're working to establish new partnerships, strengthen existing ones, and for our plan is to keep growing this. Again, it really does, like the title says, it really takes a hemisphere. Now, the Migratory Bird Initiative is not collecting new data. Rather, we're using the data that are collected by thousands of community scientists, like you who are submitting eBird checklists, the Cornell scientists who analyzes eBird data, and hundreds of professional scientists who are banding birds and tracking them. And those of you, um, those individuals, um, and I will say personally, Scott, thank you, because some of the data that we'll see here <laughs> come from your work in on black poles. And, you know, we could not be doing this without the help of everyone who contributes those data. Now, one other thing I, I want to take the opportunity to share is that the Audubon's, the, the migratory conservation platform is just one of the developing resources that is going to be available for um, for engaging people around the joy of migration and letting them know what we need to do to make a difference. The Migratory Connectivity Project is one of those efforts. It's being led by the Smithsonian and Georgetown University. And they are using information on tracking and many other types of data to create a book that will be coming out soon. Can't wait to see it. It's called Discovering Unknown Migrations, the Atlas of Migratory Connectivity for the Birds of North America. It's going to be this beautiful coffee table book. So please look out for it. It'll be fantastic. Now, let me share with you a few examples of how we're leveraging the power of visualizations and maps. Um, because the, the maps, the visualizations, they tell the stories about migratory birds that we want to use to engage and empower people to make positive change. Now, this is, um, it, you know, I think they're pretty epic. It's not a bar telegraph with, but black hole warblers are pretty darn <laughs> exciting. And I swear we didn't, we didn't coordinate this. And these are data that come from geolocators, light level geolocators that allow us to track black pole warblers across the hemisphere. I'm going to go back to this for a second so you can see it again. Um, so 
This, um, you know, this is where we can look at these animations. Um, you know, these journeys are incredible. And using the tracking day, we're actually bringing them to life to answer some of those questions that we've many of us have had on our minds for a long time. You know, how far do they go? How fast do they migrate? How much time do they actually spend outside of the United States migrating and wintering in places like South America? And so that is one of the things we're working on and we are working on it for over 500 species of, of migratory birds. But now here's another familiar example to all of you who have visited Hog um, Island or have seen the osprey camp. During the summer, you can watch osprey in the nest as they brood and rear their young. Of course, if you look at the camera right now, you'll notice that the nests are empty and most of the birds have departed on fall migration. So where do they go? Well, most of the birds that are in Maine will travel along the Eastern coast through the Caribbean islands to South America. And what's, what you notice is very different than black pole warblers is that the migration is much more complicated, yet there are patterns that pop out. We can see that there are these strong migratory pathways and birds will, you know, in different populations will merge together, they'll split apart and there's quite a bit of mixing going on. The likelihood of an emotional connection, a personal connection to a bird or a place is directly correlated with its relevance to us. When we feel connected to something, to some place, we're more likely to act to protect it. So imagine entering your zip code or a city, say you live in Dallas, Texas, or, or maybe you were born in Dallas, Texas, or just really love the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> For whatever reason, you might love Dallas. And if you could imagine entering your zip code and what you'd see is using the banding encounter data and the tracking data, you could learn that the birds that spend time in Dallas travel as far away as Alaska and Central America. And in Alaska, they rely on critical breeding habitat in areas like the Arctic Refuge, where they face continuous threats from gas and oil extraction. But personalizing migration this way and making it relevant we can connect people's love of birds in their communities to actions that they can take to protect them, even in places that are seemingly so far away and disconnected from our homes. So let's bring this back to Hog Island. We see that Hog Island here is in the center of this sort of outward, um, this is sort of the, the spokes on this um, wheel here. And you can see that birds that are that use Hawk Island um, go all over the hemisphere. And we know that Hog Island plays a critical role in the conservation of a lot of migratory species by protecting their breeding habitat and minimizing threats to birds during breeding. But if we really want to make sure that we protect these birds, then we also need to make sure that we take the actions in, um, in areas that they're connected to, like South America or Florida. If we want migratory birds to thrive, we have to protect the habitat they need and reduce threats in the places they need across the entire year. So thinking about threats, and I, I saw this in a comment um, during Scott's presentation about flight. So for songbirds, um, which was it's been mostly my area of focus as a research scientist, for songbirds like black pole warblers, they migrate at night. Light pollution is particularly problematic. And I saw that there was a question in the um, in the chat. So maybe this will will help. Um, so when what is the problem with light pollution? Well, if you're a nocturnal bird and you are migrating over an urban area and we see that there's evidence um, uh, that's coming out of radar data, in fact, that shows that birds concentrate and increase their densities over urban areas. And as they are migrating over those areas, they become disoriented by bright artificial lights and sky glow. And what this does is they start to circle around. And by doing that, they become exhausted. Some of them, you know, just fall, use up all their reserves and fall out of the sky. But a lot of them also will become disoriented and collide with buildings. And this happens at night. Now, when we combine information on light pollution with the concentration of nocturnal migrants, we reveal areas where birds experience high 
risk. And so in this map on the left, sorry, on the right, um, you can see these large dark hexagons that are circled here in red. These are areas where we see um, a high density of birds that are exposed to high light pollution levels. These maps point us to those places where we should really focus our conservation investments, for example, through Audubon's Lights Out campaign. Now, no doubt, and, and maybe I'm biased, but these maps and visualizations are pretty engaging and the messages they convey inspire us to take action. But the conservation platform is more than a place to simply raise awareness to the important places birds need and the threats they face. It's a place where we can empower people to take action. These actions are diverse. For example, through the Lights Out initiative, there are actions you can take at home, like turning off exterior lighting, um, extinguishing pot and floodlights. And you can make a personal pledge to, through the initiative, um, the conservation platform, you'll be able to make a pledge to those actions that you're willing to follow up with. Or perhaps, um, you want to take an online action and you could do this. There are so many, so many of the bedrock, um, the, the bedrock legislation that migratory birds rely on. Um, things like the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. You can take action online to support decisions that strengthen those pieces of legislation rather than weakening them. And you can, by taking an online action, you can make sure that your voice is heard by those people who represent us in making those critical decisions. Now, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, you know, we, with all the challenges birds face, and there's so many things going on, and especially as we're, you know, um, locked inside of our homes, you know, it's easy to feel some despair. But the evidence shows us that when we act, we can drive positive change. And a lot of these things, um, you know, the you can go to Audubon's webpage, you can think about, you know, the plants for birds, which Scott referenced, think about how you landscape your, you have all this time now, right? So you can spend time at home, um, think about landscaping your yard, thinking about how to make your, your home um, more bird friendly in terms of your, your lighting and avoiding window collisions, you can take online action. So when we act, we can drive positive change and now's a great time to do it. Now, I want to follow up just showing you a few examples of how we are using the migration science that lies at the heart of the platform to deliver information and tools that support the conservation and advocacy work that Audubon's doing, but we're also um, doing it with the intent and with partners so that we can have um, a larger impact even beyond Audubon. So, um, and as soon to be peer published peer review paper, Audubon used eBird abundance data to provide the first science-based evidence for the hemispheric importance of California's Central Valley and the Colorado River Delta for land birds. Now we've, we've known for a long time that these areas are really important for water birds, um, like sandpipers, or I should say shorebirds, um, um, waterfowl. Um, but now we can say that for example, if we look at the Tulare Basin, we can now say that 65 million birds use the Tulare Basin in the Central Valley during the spring. And 17 million birds migrate through the Colorado River Delta in the fall. And for some species like tree swallow, we've shown using these data, we've shown that these areas are vital to maintaining the global populations of these species. So if we look at the tree swallow, what we've discovered is that around 59% of the global population of tree swallows uses the Central Valley during fall migration. If we lose the Colorado River Delta, you know, we lose these precious birds. But the other important thing to really emphasize is that if we lose places like the Colorado River Delta, we not only lose birds, but humans feel the impact of it. Not because we're losing the beautiful species that we see, but because it's a, it's a critical source of water. The Colorado River is a critical source of water for so many communities in the area. So we often like to say, you know, what's good for birds is also good for humans. 
Together, Audubon and many other organizations, agencies, and institutions have invested deeply in conservation efforts to protect important areas for birds and min minimize threats there. And as Scott mentioned earlier, the vast majority of our work has been in these northern breeding grounds. And we're just starting to understand more about how important these winter areas are and where birds are spending the time in the winter. And what my career focus has been on is the migration period of the annual cycle. Where are birds stopping during migration? What do they need to be successful? And all of these investments are great. But if we just look at sites independently, we could really be um, missing an opportunity to leverage our conservation investments. If we spend a lot of um, resources, energy, time in one of these areas like the boreal forest or, you know, in Alaska, the Arctic refuge. If we don't also protect the places that these birds need during migration and during winter, we will not be able to protect those birds. We won't be able to reverse the declines. And so it's really important to think about how they're connected and the new tracking data and those, those banding data um, when we catch birds and they're re-encountered somewhere else in the hemisphere, that allows us to make those connections and understand those migration networks. Why does MBI matter? Well, simply put, if we're going to protect the migratory birds we love and successfully halt and even better reverse population declines, then we need to work together across the hemisphere as a closely woven network. And despite all the challenges that migratory birds face, there's one major thing that they have going for them. Over one, 1 1.7, 1.75 million Audubon members and millions of additional bird lovers. We have a network of 450 chapters 41 centers and educational programs like Hog Island Camps. By working together, we have unparalleled power. And with that, um, I'll end and we'll have some time for questions. And if anybody would like to, couldn't end this without having puffin pictures in here. Um, but if you um, are interested in learning more, there's some contact information or just simply Google Audubon Migratory Birds. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jill. I'm, if you'll stop sharing your screen here. I can navigate back. <laughs> Let me see here. I will um, bring some of your questions from the chat and from the comment section uh, for you and Scott to answer. Let me see if I didn't, I'm having trouble getting out. And thanks so much to all of you who have been um, dropping your questions in the chat. I've been, I've definitely been uh, collecting those. All right. So wonderful presentations from Scott and Jill about migration, about the Migratory Bird Initiative. Uh, I'm going to bring some of these uh, questions out. And we have questions from uh, people watching on Facebook, from participants here in the Zoom, and also some people even emailed their questions that couldn't make it. Uh, so our first question uh, actually comes from quite a few people, um, and they all have to do with population decline. So Joanna uh, asked about Baltimore Orioles. Debbie was asking about Eastern Bluebird declines. S Scott Anthony says, are migration numbers down? What are what are we seeing with bird declines um, across the country with all different species? Well, I'm 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 happy to jump in on that. I mean, as as Jill mentioned, you know, there's there's pretty good science based on based on the kind of big data that we were talking about before that we know that we have lost about three billion birds since I got serious about bird watching back in the late '60s and early '70s. Um, so, you know, the old timers that I knew when I was starting, who's was, there's not as many birds as there used to be. Now I'm that old timer and it's true. There just are not as many. Um, now I, you know, I think actually in many areas, 
eastern bluebirds are, are doing pretty well. Um, they've they were that was a rare bird when I was a kid in the 1960s, and now they're very common in many areas because people have put up nest boxes. But um, you know, the group of birds that is at the at most serious risk that has declined faster and at a steeper rate than any other group of of land birds are grassland birds. Um, you know, we've seen we've seen how um, our our misuse of of grasslands um, has driven them down. But you know that. And, and Jill can talk maybe a little bit more about this, but there was there was a a nugget of really good news in that same um, paper that came out last year about three billion birds gone because the the scientists who wrote that noted that waterfowl and wetland birds their numbers have increased dramatically in the last thirty or forty years, and the reason for that is because we got serious about wetland conservation. We put money into wetland conservation and restoration. Um, whether it was from private organizations like Ducks Unlimited and, and the, the federal government and private landowners and conservation organizations, we can do the same thing for other groups of birds. We can do the same thing for grassland birds. Um, if we create the habitat, the birds will come back. Um, we can do the same thing for declining land birds by, by safeguarding the, the habitats that they need. And, you know, the kind of, the kind of mapping data um, that Jill was talking about before, you know, like, for example, noting how many birds are being drawn into urban areas. You know, we focused for many years on protecting um, more rural and, and wilderness areas, thinking that was better quality bird habitat. And it might be, but it may be the biggest bang for our conservation buck, may be protecting and restoring migratory bird habitat in urban areas and suburban areas where these birds are being drawn in by light pollution anyway. All right, our next question is uh, from Lucy Rogers uh, and also from Joris Nelson. Both of them uh, have questions about birds who are migrating currently through California with the fires, are they able to reroute to different safer locations? And if not, um, what are they doing to find food? Yeah, this is a tricky one. I, I think Scott and I probably have lots of things to say. Um, I, I am an East Coaster too, um, but you know, spent enough time in you know Southern California to know that fires are really severe. And I think first and foremost, what what always comes to to our minds are the impacts on on the human communities. Um, but we're starting to learn more about the impacts of fires on birds. You know, it's um, you you can't ever anticipate when a fire is going to happen, right? And so we don't really have any tracking data that we can really, uh, you know, target the direct impacts of fire, but we do know that fires impact birds through, you know, a variety of ways. Um, when we're looking at their habitat, you know, fires will drastically alter the habitat. And for a lot of birds, you know, that might be removing stopover habitat that they might need. Um, but, but let me say that there are some birds that rely on fire. So it's a much more complicated, um, it's a much more complicated um, situation. But one thing is for certain is that while some birds need fire and some don't, what we have done is we've drastically changed the frequency and intensity of the fires, how large they are and climate change is going to exacerbate that. Um, now in terms of, you know, direct impacts, um, you know, smoke, you know, is going to impact visibility. And there have been some of the birds that are dying off in New Mexico and other areas. And part one of the hypotheses for that is that some of those fires may contribute to birds leaving earlier or, you know, maybe, you know, being moved out of areas that they typically would have used. Um, spending more energy as they're moving further across the landscape to avoid those areas. Um, but those are some hypotheses, right? It's really, you know, there's still a lot of science that needs to be done. And, and also, if I can just jump in on the on the, the bird deaths in New Mexico that got so much attention, uh, there's been some preliminary science um, that's been released that, that shows that the biggest impacts have been on insect eating birds, like particularly swallows, um, as well as uh, warblers and flycatchers. Uh, they were in emaciated condition. And um, it may well be that the biggest impact on those birds was the, um, that sudden sharp cold snap that hit um, parts of the West uh, where it went from 90 degrees one day to a snowstorm the next day. Um, the birds that seemed to suffer the most were the ones that depend on flying insects that, um, but you know, 
it certainly, certainly the smoke and the stress from the wildfires can't be helping matters. Our next question is from Renee, who lives in Georgia. She's already seen a red-breasted nuthatch this year. She remembers the invasion of two years ago. Are we going to see another invasion this year? Heck yeah. Um, it's already going on. Um, there, as I said earlier, uh, before we started there to, to some folks, they're, they're going to make it all the way to the Gulf of Mexico this year. Um, there was a, there was a bumper crop of cones last year in, um, in Eastern Canada, um, conifer cones that, the, that they depend on. They had a tremendous breeding season this year. There's not a lot of cones up in the north for them, so they're heading south looking for food. And this cuts back, I think, to one of the questions that was in the chat about what's the difference with eruptions between, you know, some birds are moving south because their food supplies disappeared. In other cases, it's because you had a, a lot of food and a really abundant breeding season. That's what happens, for example, with snowy owls and, and also with northern solid owls. So, um, you know, there's all these layers of complexity in bird migration, so many different strategies and approaches that birds have. But yeah, it's going to be a great year for red-breasted nuthatches in the east. Our next question is uh, from Jocelyn. She asks, do we know how high uh, migratory birds can fly? Jill, do you want to take that one? Sure. And um, it, it varies. And that's always, you know, <laughs> unsatisfactory answer. Um, but, you know, they can be pretty high. Um, and, uh, you know, thinking, I think in terms of meters, so maybe about yards, you know, sometimes they can fly up to, you know, 2,500 meters, yards, 4,000. And then you have birds that fly over the Himalayas, right? You have, have geese that are just, I mean, it's really, again, they're these epic stories of birds pushing all of the limits. So that's, they're pretty impressive. Scott, I'm sure you have some more numbers for us. Well, it's, <laughs> it, it, I was going to mention the bar-headed geese that fly over the Himalayas. And um, it, it, that's remarkable in and of itself because, of course, they're they're exercising. Um, but you know, when you think about human climbers on Everest, how it takes them weeks of slow acclimation, going from you know base camp to the next camp to the next camp, and letting themselves acclimate. The bar-headed geese take off from the lowlands of of India, head north, and go right up over top of the Himalayas all in one sweep. Um, and they do it without suffering from, you know, pulmonary embolisms or, you know, cerebral edemas or all the things that kill humans. Um, we don't, we're starting to understand how they do this physiologically, but a lot of it's still a little, kind of a bit of a mystery to us. All right, so we have a question from Brenda Hinty. Uh, she said that you spoke about um, light pollution and uh, glass collisions. Uh, how about noise pollution? What, what effect does that have on migratory birds? Hmm. Do you want to take that one, Jill? Well, I'll, I'll start. Um, you know, and this is a really good one because we're, you know, you have urban birds are exposed to a lot of light pollution, but there's always also a whole lot of noise. And, you know, there are some birds that, um, you know, as they're, they're moving through areas, there's a lot of noise pollution, right? And, you know, when we're thinking about, you know, during breeding, you know, how, you know, migratory birds, you know, those noises can impact birds' abilities to communicate by vocalizations. They really mask it a lot. Um, and some birds will make calls during migration. It's still a lot of evidence, especially for the smaller birds, um, like warblers, you know, there are lots of call notes. Do they actually migrate in, in groups? Um, do they communicate with each other? There's still some uncertainty about that, but clearly if there's a lot of noise, um, it, it masks their ability to do that. Now, when they're flying really high, not so much of a problem, right? Because they're flying high and it's above a lot of that noise. But when they're starting to fly lower, it can be, um, it can complicate um, their ability to, to communicate. And there's also evidence that birds, when they're migrating, they use conspecific vocalizations. So vocalizations from the same species to decide when to settle in an area. So if say you're yellow-breasted chat and you're flying north and you hear other yellow-breasted chats calling, well then that's a good sign that you should 
spend time that you might want to rest there. Um, but you know, for birds that might be using some of these areas where there's more noise, it's really difficult to get that additional acoustic information. Thanks so much. Um, we have answered most of the questions out there. So I think we'll wrap things up here. Um, but if you guys do have questions that you really need to get answered, you can always email hogisland at audubon.org and I will try my best to get answers for you. Um, I really want to thank both Scott and Jill for their presentations. And also I want to thank all the people out there who joined us tonight and have watched uh, these presentations on bird migration. We are able to provide these programs for free um, thanks to your donations. There is a donation link in the chat box in the comment section. Um, please consider making a donation to Hog Island. And next week, invite all of your friends uh, who are just wanting to get started in birding. We're gonna have a presentation on introduction to birding by Hog Island instructor Holly Merker. And our birding connection will be presented by National Audubon Society's Governmental Affairs Coordinator, Taiki James. Uh, please join us, encourage people to, um, to tune in. We'll be streaming again on Facebook and also on Zoom uh, on Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you so much, Jill. And thank all of you. Have a great night. <laughs>